I'm the youngest of six siblings, and my next youngest is six years older than me, so my siblings are quite a bit older. And I remember feeling like, since I was so much younger, I had a lot to, I had to, I had to be really funny, and I had to be really smart, and I had to be really to like, keep up with everyone and get everyone's attention. Hi, my name is Haley Penn, and I am recovering from low self-worth, negative self-talk, and body image issues. Growing up, I felt like I needed to perform and be perfect a lot. Um, I felt like I needed to be the best at everything um, in order to get that, let's see, like recognition or praise. So, oh, well, if I make head cheerleader or if I am class president or if I am this and that, like that's gonna be enough for me to get, like to feel worthy. I just don't feel that I learned that I was, that my worth was in Christ. Um, I always felt the need to take care of everyone else and make sure, you know, mom and dad are getting along or the siblings are okay or, you know, um, make sure that everyone else is okay. And so I didn't feel like I had the space to make sure that I was okay. And then in seventh grade, my brother um, died suddenly of a drug overdose. So in eighth grade, um, it was probably about a year after my brother had passed away. Um, I had been struggling really, really bad with anxiety and depression. I would text my mom every day at school, um, just being like, I can't handle this. Like I can't handle being in my own brain. One day I was like, I just, I literally just can't take it anymore. Um, and I remember I was just going to like stop eating. Um, I was like, I'm just gonna stop eating and basically my body will just not be able to handle it and um, that'll kill me, basically. I remember standing in my bedroom and I was looking up at the ceiling and praying to God and just saying like, God, if you're here, um, please just help me. Like I just, I have nothing left. I have uh, nothing to lose. I just, I, I desperately like just need you. And after I said that prayer, um, a couple days following that and just the weeks following that, I just started to feel a sense of hope for the first time in a while. Um, I started getting in my Bible and that started really helping me put my focus on the Lord uh, and building a relationship with Him. Um, and so that was when I feel like I truly started a relationship with Jesus. I struggled quite a bit still with still feeling that, like I don't matter basically, like it, like I don't have to worry about me or what I'm feeling or doing. A lot of the voices that I've let in are centered around, you know, wanting to, wanting to always improve and wanting to always be my best and wanting to always do well in life. And so when I would make a mistake or um, have a setback, those those thoughts that I would allow in my mind were, would be, you know, why would you do that? Um, you're smarter than that. Now you're, now you're having to backtrack and, uh, work harder to get to where you want to be. You know, saying those things once or twice might not sound so bad, but when you have them cycling through your brain constantly um, until you do that workout and feel like you're in a good enough place to be safe from getting fat or things like that, I mean, that's hours and sometimes days of you feeling, of you hearing those thoughts that you're just not good enough. I remember like I went to a friend's birthday party and I remember thinking like, 
okay, like Haley, just don't talk, like just don't like make much facial expressions, like just listen, like nobody really wants you here, like they just they just like feel sorry for you and um you like don't be a bother to these people. Like you're just gonna be here and um you're just gonna like do your duty of being here. You know, and I like hung out with with the friend my friends and had reconnected with some other friends and I remember them like they would make random comments to me and they would say, oh, like, you're so fun to be around or like, you're so silly or like, you make funny jokes or like, oh, you're beautiful or like things like that. And I was like, oh yeah, like it started to remind me of like the little Haley that, that has always been there, but had never gotten to truly like blossom and like, like see herself and like love herself and like feel like just worthy of, um, <gasps> just like being, although like this journey has been extremely like terrifying. Um, I just knew God, like God is like, I just have so much more for you. Like, like you're gonna, you're gonna find your identity in me. You're gonna find who you are and like what, um, the gifts that I've given you, um, that grace other people and, and bring joy to other people and the things about you that can bring joy to yourself. You can be okay with who you are and know that I'm with you and know that no matter what happens, like, like I am your safe place. I love Haley's story because it is a great reminder that our identity is not found in the world around us. Our identity is not even found in what we do, but our identity is found in Jesus. Have you ever wondered why you do what you do? You ever stop to ask yourself, why in the world do I do what I do? Uh, you know, I don't know you, but I think I know how your year started. You started it out by saying, I'm gonna be really good about my finances this year. New Year's resolution, we are setting the budget. We're gonna save money. And then you got six, seven, eight months into this thing and you're still a slave to American Express and still trying to pay off the credit cards, the visas, the MasterCards, right? You started this year and you said to yourself, this is the year that I get the diet on track. And you, you put a game plan in place. You change some behaviors, you set a plan. Uh, your friends went out to eat and you decided, I'm just eating chicken tonight. And you sat down at the table with everybody and what'd you order? Chicken, fried steak, right? And a side of vanilla ice cream with it and you totally blew the diet away. You know, this year you determined, I'm gonna date better. I'm setting the standards higher. And before you knew it, you found yourself in another toxic relationship, one you had to get out of, right? Why is it that with all these intentions, with all these little changes to our behaviors that we make, there's still something that hasn't shifted. And it's like the thing, it's like the linchpin that everything hangs on here. You know, the Bible speaks to this. The Bible in Proverbs 13, seven says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You see this? Like on the very deepest level, the things that you think about yourself, the things that you believe within your heart, that's the way that your life is going to trend. Out of yourself flows these things here. As a man believes in his heart, so he is. And the Bible starts to speak to this. It says it's, it's not just about changing the, be the behavior, but there's like an identity shift that needs to happen. As a man thinks in his heart, this is where it starts, is with the man, is with the very personhood, the very identity of a person. It's saying it's not just do, but it's the who you got to look at. You can change all of these different things, but if you haven't been transformed inwardly, it's almost like you didn't pull the roots up on this thing. You just mowed over the weed. And I think the Bible here is pretty clear that each and every one of us has a transformation that needs to take place. If you want to change what you do, it's not just about changing these different behaviors here. It's about changing the way you think about who you are. And I don't know about you, but for me, I rarely think about myself in a kind way. Uh, I'm probably harsher to myself than anybody else in my life. I, I stopped to ask myself this the other day. I was like, why? 
why am I so hard on myself? Why am I so critical of myself? Where did I get these beliefs along the way? Are these things true? Where did I pick this up? And I think Jesus, he speaks to this in John 8. He's like, you know, there are so many of you who have heard the devil's lies along the way. When he speaks, he's the father of lies. He's, this is his native tongue, the scriptures say. And he started to, to spout these lies, to say these things for so long that you've just started to believe them. Jesus says, when I speak, you hardly recognize it because it's the truth. You and I are more used to listening to the lies. We've just kind of downloaded these and made them our default along the way, right? And so when you read things in the scriptures that's like, you are more than a conqueror. You read that and you're like, me? Uh, I don't know about that. When the Bible says that you're chosen or holy, you're like, uh, I don't know, maybe you got the wrong guy. It's funny, it's just so easy to believe the lies, but so difficult sometimes to believe the truth about our identity. I think about the moment in the garden when the serpent came along to Eve. Do you remember this? Eve was there obeying the commandments of God, living out her God-given identity that the Lord had given her. And then Satan came in, and do you remember the, the weapon that he was armed with? Yeah, the serpent didn't come with a, a knife, didn't come with a blade, he didn't come with a gun or anything like that. Instead, he came armed with what? A lie. And once Eve had believed the lie, well, then her behavior began to change. And what seemed good in her eyes ended up reaping destruction along the way. I wonder what kind of lies you've believed along the way. You've thought to yourself, I'm never going to be able to live out this budget thing because I'm just no good with money. I'm a failure when it comes to money. I'm never going to be able to be in healthy relationships because I'm just a toxic person. I'm never going to be able to get this diet on track here because my family struggled with it and I struggled with it and I'm just one big loser when it comes to this sort of thing. You've started to believe these defining things along the way. They've turned into identity statements, right? That you didn't just fail along the way, but you are in fact a failure. Do you see the difference there? Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You need to take a clue. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. It makes me think of this moment uh, years ago when we were moving our daughter out of a crib in our house. So she was really little and she was moving on to the big girl bed. Uh, You've seen cribs before. They're like little jail cells for kids. And we had her inside this little crib and we were going to move her out. But I was hesitant because every time we moved her out, even as a, a little toddler, she would just reap destruction in the house. And so I told my wife, I was, I don't know, maybe she needs a little bit more time in the crib. And so Megan said, now let's, let's move her to the big girl bed and we'll see what happens. And so uh, I remember the night before, uh, before we'd started the, the construction on the bed, I woke up early that morning and I could hear her in the room next to us, probably 6 a.m. and she's crying out, Daddy, Mommy. And I'd have to get up and I'd go in there where the crib was and I'd pull her out of the bed and I'd watch her tear the room up and I'd just wait up until mom got up and I could hand the kid off, right? Uh, Well, the day after, when we'd finally moved her into that big girl bed, there were no bars on the side. She was free to go. And frankly, I was pretty nervous. So we went to bed that night, about five or six in the next morning. I heard those same cries. Mommy! Daddy! And I walked into Emery's room, and when I opened the door, there was Emery, stiff as a board, laying in that bed. She hadn't even realized that she could get up and get out, that she didn't have bars, that she was free to go. She had this thought in her mind that had limited her activity. Do you see this here, what I'm trying to line up? I think for each of us, you've started to believe certain things, and it has in turn affected your behavior. If you want to change what you do, you've got to start thinking about who you are in the right light. And when you know the truth, Jesus says the truth will set you free. And so what does the Bible say about who you are? What does it say about this new nature you've been given? The Bible says that you are a new creation. In fact, you get to wear the identity of Jesus Christ. The way that God views you is the way that he views his son. I love the account in Matthew chapter 3 when Jesus is baptized and you can hear 
the voice of God from heaven. Here he says that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when you hear that, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, of course he's saying that about Jesus. It's Jesus. This is the miracle maker. This is the one that went to the cross. This is the one that paid for our sins here. But God isn't just saying this about Jesus. In fact, this is not just a commentary about the Son of God. I think that was a commentary on who God is. Because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. Jesus hadn't paid for sins in that moment yet. Jesus hadn't performed a miracle yet. This is the way the Father views his children. He's, he's, he looks at them and he loves them and he's pleased with them. The way that he views you is one of his kids. You're beloved. You're chosen. You're holy and loved by God. Today our prayer is that you'll accept that new identity and from there, Watch the transformation that takes place. God bless you. We'll see you next time.